to talk about the uh, flying information with the F-14 uh, and we weren't authorised to do it and we, uh, we weren't supposed to do it but I remember on, uh, when we were doing the combat with the 14s and the 18s as we were flying along um, into our below us in our flying area came two Russian Mays their uh, uh, maritime reconnaissance aircraft uh, and so we made a, a mental plot of where they were and when we'd finished the um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the combat, we all piled in, chased after the maze. We were flying along, I don't know, about a thousand feet over the sea. So you were asking me are there any photographs of it, only if you go and ask the Russians. Because past this Russian came four F3s, two F14s and two F18s. It must have been fantastic to, to, to have been on the maze to see them. I reckon they, well, they obviously knew we were up above them because um, they used to fly around the maze a lot. Um, on, on looking at the, the American fleet uh, and keeping an eye on the Middle East and what was going on there. And of course the American Sixth Fleet was out there look, keeping an eye on them. Uh, and often we, we were tasked uh, a thing called Blue Pencil to go and uh, find the, either the Russian fleet or the Russian Maritime Reconnaissance Force. But that reminds me, um, I sound like an old boy of uh, 68 now, that reminds me when I was a lad. <laughs> When I was on PR9s, because you wanted me to talk a bit more about the PR9, um, this was in the um, 70s, I, I was uh, late 60s, early 70s I was in Malta. This was during the, uh, the Gulf War, no not the Gulf War, the Arab-Israeli Arab War with the Egyptians. And the Israelis had bought uh, a series of gunboats, which the French I think were building in Toulouse for them. And when the war kicked off, the Six Day War, or whichever one it was, they've had so many, the, um, the Israelis wouldn't release the gunboats to the, uh, sorry, the French wouldn't release the, the gunboats to the Israelis. So one dark and stormy night, the uh, Israelis went in undercover and stole their own gunboats and sailed them out of France and across the uh, Med back towards Israel. Whether the French knew about this, the French are a duplicitous lot, so I suspect that they sort of un unlock the main gates. But anyway, off they went. And um, we were tasked uh, from Malta, where we were holding um, uh, QRA, Recce QRA, to go and find them and see what was going on. So what we did was we had two PR lines, one at high level, uh, spotting ships. And then we were at low level, uh, investigating those ships to see whether they were um, fast boats, uh, pleasure boats, or whether they were gunboats, or whatever. And eventually we saw these, uh, I think it was two of them at least, coming towards us with this, I don't know what speed they were doing, probably the best part of 40 knots, something like that. These huge bow waves plowing through the med. So we were able to go and chase around and, and take some photographs of them. Um, and off they went back to Israel uh, with us cheering them on. Go boys, go boys. What, what I didn't know was the Daily Express had uh, chartered a small uh, private airplane out of Siganella in Sicily and uh, they were flying around trying to get a scoop. But they were listening out to our radio frequencies uh, and obviously they heard us report back to the top camera and so that we'd found the gunboats and he could come and join us. Um, next day in the front page of the Express was RAF shadows Israeli gunboats. Well of course we were a neutral country and we, had, uh, we weren't supposed to be there. So I got a phone call to say were you involved in that sortie? If so, why? And who authorised it? And um, I said, well, actually, it wasn't me. It was uh, the tasking cell at HQ Malta. And they were asked who authorised it, and they said it was the MOD. And of course, the foreign officer said, we're not to, but the MOD said, yeah, go on and do it. So that was great watching this great pile of, of um, horse manure flow back uphill. Normally, it dumped itself firmly on my shoulders. And, uh, but on this occasion, I was able to deflect it back upstream. But the PR9 was a terrific aircraft. Um, I say the PR7 was nice, very stable platform, um, but it was a bit steady eddy really. Um, I remember flame, double flaming one out in Singapore. We used to go and photograph Borneo, as I said, do the mapping for them. And on the way back, if the weather was bad, we hadn't taken any film, um, then we used to fly as hard as we could. Um, to give the Lightnings in Singapore Tenga a chance to come and do some high-flying tactics. So I was pushed this PR7 to its absolute limit and we were clawing at the air uh, and we heard the Lightnings come up towards us 
And uh, as I heard the lightning, it's called Judy Judy, which means they were getting visual with us around the back. I hauled on the control column, completely deflected the airflow around the engine intakes, and both engines snuffed out. There's only one way we were going to go, and that was down. So I lowered the nose, tried to get a hot relight, couldn't. Still kept the turn on. This time I can now hear the lightning saying, we've lost him, we've lost him. GCI radar were squawking and telling them where we'd gone. They lost contact with us. We then did the 360 turn, just about, got one engine relit, and as we rolled out around the back, we got the second engine relight, and there were these two lightnings cruising, going down, going, where's he gone, where's he gone? And we rolled out behind and went, daka, 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 and managed to shoot him down. This all sounds very, very Jolly Rogerish, but my navigator was sat on the rumble seat. There was one on the bank seat at the back. But being the PR7, there was one on the sort of uh, ginty seat on the side. He was strapping on his parachute, strapping on his dinghy, trying to find the emergency exit because he thought he was going to dive out the side of the aircraft and go for a swim in the South China Sea, which he was not happy about at all. Luckily, we got the engines relit and we went back to Singapore. And of course, by the time we'd had a few beers, and I bought my navigators lots of beers on that evening um, just to make up for it. We had the crowing rights over 74 squadron to Tigers because one of our knackered old cameras had shot down two of their lovely lightnings. So that was good fun. The other thing I had was uh, we were going, I, I love Singapore, but I like Hong Kong more, you know. Um, we were going from Singapore up to Hong Kong on a liaison trip just to have a look. It was part of our, our role was to keep an eye on what they were doing uh, north of Hong Kong. And so we used to fly up there and you had to go up as a co-pilot, or it's not a co-pilot, but sitting on the, um, in the cockpit of another airplane first. You couldn't go up cold. So I went up on the seat of a Hercules, spent a couple of nights there and then came back. Picked up my navigator, took the PR9 up there. Got airborne out of Singapore, and unbeknown to us, we got, got a lot of water in the cockpit, which froze the radios. And these days you've got manual selectors, rather than push buttons, manual selectors, and they froze the selection. So I couldn't talk to anybody when I was handed over to Malaysian Airway, uh, um, Airways. Um, and actually, we lost contact about the same point as that uh, aircraft lost just recently, so it was a bit spooky. Anyway, we thought, well, no problem, we'll, we'll give Vietnam controlled airspace a call as we get a bit closer. Um, but as we were going up, we suddenly encountered a great big long line of cumulonimbus clouds. Now, the, the, the Air Force were restricted to certain corridor band heights, and that was Air Force only, so there was like a, a medium and a high, and we were in the higher upper bracket. Um, but these, PR, these um, uh, QNIMs were right in our path, so we decided to climb over the top of them. Try to call up Vietnam, um, the Americans, and say, this is us, we're climbing out of our safety bracket, but there was no reply. So uh, we, we just flew over the top of the uh, thunderstorms. And as we cleared the thunderstorms, I looked out to my left, and there coming towards us from over the horizon were four contrails coming out of Vietnam. And I said to my nerve, Dick Turner, I said, Dick, if I was you, I would tighten your straps because I haven't got a clue what's coming towards us. I don't know if we've been intercepted or what. And in those days, it was a shooting war, and you, Americans are very good at shooting first and asking questions afterwards, you know. And of course, I was, I thought, um, blue sky theory, big sky, that the only other guys who were going to be up at heights that we were up were going to be U2s, either the R's or the S's, and probably the R's actually. Um, and um, bullshit waving flag there, bullshit flag. Um, so I thought, well, they're not going to have much of a chance, but of course, in there, Anyway, a missile will take out a lot of height. Anyway, as we got a bit closer to one another, I could see there were four, four aircraft in uh, battle formation. Um, and then, as it got even closer, it actually transpired. It was a B-52 coming back from a bombing raid with its four sets of engines on its wings, which looked all the world like a, a, flight, a flight of American Phantoms coming towards us. <coughs> Excuse me, they flew right underneath us on the perfect 90 collision and off they went to the Philippines. So my heart was pounding at that stage, but we still hadn't got talking to anybody. So my nav actually managed to get hold of Hong Kong Centre, the RAF Centre, on the HF radio. He then picked up the phone and dialed air traffic and relayed all our information, got us clearance into Hong Kong airspace. 
and as we started to descend the radio started to unfreeze and the moisture evaporated off and we got our radios back. But flying into Hong Kong was just a wonderful thing. I mean you actually, you've got points on the ground that you've got to fly over and then when you get to the last point you've got to do a hard descending right hand turn, line up with the runway and then land on the runway in use. Which for PR9 wasn't a great problem, but you can imagine in those days, something like a 747 with 500 or 400 passengers on board doing this steep spiraling and descending turn. It must have been a frightening experience. But, um, and then we spent a couple of days in Hong Kong liaising with uh, the army and the helicopters just to have a look at the border. We went up to the new territories. The Queen Mary, I think it was, had been sunk in the harbour. It had uh, been, well, some say it was an accident, allegedly, but some say it was uh, more than that. Uh, and so we had a flight round Hong Kong Harbour. And of course in the evenings we were free to um, partake of the local nightlife, which uh, we won't go into here. Good luck.